we get started, we have a very uh, important reminder. We are going to have a lot of really beautiful people telling some beautiful stories about recovery. We want to make sure that everybody uh, gets a chance to speak. So if you look in the very back of the auditorium, you will see our colleague Cindy. So let's give a big round of applause for Cindy. Come on. Come on. You know it. And so if you, when you are up here speaking, when you've got about a minute left, she will hold up our world famous one minute sign. When you have 30 seconds left, she will hold up the 30 second sign. If, God forbid, you have gone over your time limit, you will get the dreaded dude, no really sign, <laughs> which means it's time for you to please uh, wrap up. Um, so uh, before we, we jump in, I want to uh, invite my colleague, um, Gary DeCarolis, up here. Uh, Gary, where did you go? Gary, come on, turn for Gary DeCarolis, everybody. Come on. You know it. You know it. Um, and we were looking around the office the other day at some photos of one of the first recovery days. And it was just a very small group of people over in a conference room at the Capitol Plaza Hotel. And we realized that those folks were the real giants who were talking about recovery back when nobody was. And we are standing on their shoulders. And we're very, very lucky to be uh, living with that legacy. Um, and uh, we want to honor uh, one of those giants now. And I'd love to have Gary um, talk about Dale. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we lost one of our true pioneers in recovery, Dale Robb, this a uh, couple days ago, who started, founded, and worked day in, day out at Serenity House. Um, he passed away a few days ago. So I thought nothing better than to start our morning with a moment of silence and help send him to the other side with all our love and support. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Great. It's, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome up to the podium our first uh, special guest. Um, one of the themes this year is going to be uh, Vermont Recovers Together. And one of the ways that we recover together is through tremendous political support and through uh, innovative programs like recovery residences. I think we're so lucky to have a, um, a president pro tem of the Senate, uh, Tim Ash, who's got a background in housing and who's been a uh, fierce advocate uh, for both treatment and recovery. And Tim, we'd love to have you join us up here. Well, thank you and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name's Tim Ash. I'm the president of the Vermont Senate. And um, as was just mentioned, one of my past lives was working as an affordable housing developer for Cathedral Square. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Cathedral Square. Uh, Cathedral Square is uh, mostly known for providing um, housing for senior citizens uh, of modest means, but also have another part of the mission, which is to provide housing for people with disabilities uh, and people with mental health challenges and oftentimes people with addiction challenges. Um, so that was always, um, it wasn't the tagline of Cathedral Square, but it was one of our important uh, side missions, which I felt really proud uh, to be able to uh, partner with organizations like the Howard Center and the Lund Center, uh, providing housing and supports to people who were really um, um, in need of assistance. I'll just tell you briefly, you know, when I was a kid, uh, like most people, the images of addiction were always um, filled with stigma, rather um, bleak. Um, but my dad, who spent more than 40 years as a probation officer, ultimately being the chief of probation at the courthouse in the community I grew up in, um, was 
along with the judge at the local court and other partners, uh, one of the pioneers of one of the first so-called drug courts in the United States. And uh, I was, as I was driving down today, I thought that was 30 years ago. And that's like, I, now that I have to say things like 30 years ago, I'm realizing how old I am. I'm getting, I should say. Um, but through that lens, I was able to see that um, using the drug court model in the community I grew up in, it was really saying that this is a public health issue and this is something we have to get the stigma out of the way and actually get people on the road to recovery. I'm already very impressed by the vibe in the room, which is uh, largely celebratory. Um, I think that uh, oftentimes when I'm over in the state house talking about uh, how we're gonna provide support for people in recovery or people um, facing those early days of confronting uh, their addiction, uh, we, we often think about uh, the hardest moments. Um, today, I think, really is a day of hope and inspiration. Uh, and I can think of few things more inspiring, really, than people who have confronted their addiction and are on that journey to recovery. I also want to say that it is also inspiring the people, family, friends, coworkers who support people on that journey. One of the other uh, things that's important to me, um, and I've, I've spent basically the last eight years of my time in the Senate working with some of the people in this room co-writing almost every piece of legislation that relates to uh, fighting addiction, uh, supporting people in recovery, uh, mental health policies, uh, and I've been very proud to work alongside people in this room on that. And much of the emphasis has been on opiate addiction. And opiate addiction obviously has been um, tearing its way through communities throughout this country. But one of the things I've really tried to impress upon my peers is not to forget alcohol and other addictions, which in volume of human lives affected continues to be the single biggest public health challenge when it comes to addiction. So I know it sometimes sounds a little strange for me to make a point of saying that we have to remember um, alcohol misuse and alcohol addiction and alcoholism and make sure that's still in the conversation because I know that it's tearing so many lives apart. So I'll be um, brief now and just reiterate how uh, completely reaffirming it is to have people in the room here celebrating recovery. Um, from the point of view uh, of the legislature where sometimes it can seem very clinical writing uh, words on pieces of legislation you're all putting faces um, to why we do the work in the first place. Uh, this is going to be my last year in the State Senate because I'm attempting to move on to other pastures and just want to say thank you to those of you who I've worked elbow to elbow with writing most of the legislation uh, which has enabled programs like the Recovery uh, Network across the state and the funding. Uh, every day I've come down here, I haven't done it to uh, be some guy who gets his picture in the paper, but really rooted in trying to make people's lives better. Um, but none of that would be possible without both the people who do paid work uh, to support people in this room, but also the very people in the room who have confronted their own challenges and are fighting their way to recovery. So thank you so much for the inspiration you're giving me. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And uh, as Tim mentioned, w one of the real backbones of Vermont's communities and the backbone of Vermont's uh, recovery supports are our turning point centers. In every corner of the state, there is a, a hub where people can go and get extraordinary um, care and recovery supports and recovery services. They are really, really beautiful. What we'd like to do now is to honor the staff and volunteers and board members and guests of those centers. So when you hear your center mentioned, if you could please uh, stand up and remain standing. I know that we've got the uh, Kingdom Recovery Center from St. Jay in the house. <laughs> We've got the uh, North Central Vermont Turning Point Center in the house. We've got the Turning Point Center of Addison County in the house. Come on, St. Jay, stay up, stay up. 
We've got the Turning Point Center of Bennington in the house. The Turning Point Center of Central Vermont in the house. Let's hear for Barry. The Turning Point Center of Chittenden County in the house. That's my old Turning Point. The Turning Point of Franklin County up in St. Albans. The Turning Point Center of Rutland is here today. The Turning Point Center of Springfield. The Turning Point Center of Wyndham County. The Upper Valley Turning Point. The Journey to Recovery Community Center of Newport and our beloved Vermont Recovery Network staff and volunteer. Let's hear it. Thank you all. Great, thank you. Vermont recovers together thanks to you all. It's really, really a beautiful um, thing to see. We are also extremely lucky to have a uh, Department of Health and our own ADAP that does such a nice job in understanding the power of recovery and the power of Vermont's recovery workforce and supports. And I'd like to ask our, our good friends from ADAP to stand up just so we can give them some recognition. Come on! Yeah, yeah! That's what I'm talking about. I love it. And um, we'd love to uh, invite up the uh, the head of ADAP, the Deputy Commissioner, Kelly Daugherty, to, to share her thoughts and views on 2020. Kelly, we're lucky to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Peter. Um, and welcome, everyone, and congratulations on Recovery Day 2020. Um, I have been in this role at the Health Department working closely with ADAP for it will be one year next week. And I just want to say that one of the most uh, inspiring parts of my role has been meeting so many of you in the recovery community. And it has really been an inspiration and sort of a life-changing uh, experience for me to meet all of you. And, and I'm so grateful for that. And I'm learning so much. And um, it's just been wonderful. And at the Department of Health, broadly, our mission is to promote and protect the health of all Vermonters. And I think that supporting recovery and people's paths to recovery is such a critical part of the Department of Health's mission. We value and support recovery throughout Vermont. And um, the recovery centers that we just recognized, uh, the Department of Health provides support for all of those recovery centers across the state and all of your centers uh, supported services to almost 3,000 people a month on average throughout the state of Vermont, which is amazing. <laughs> and every year, thousands of Vermonters transition from treatment to recovery and nearly 28,000 people across the state accessed services at recovery centers. This past year, 92 recovery coaches were trained through the Recovery Coach Academy. And uh, yeah. And those recovery coaches are supporting so many people through all stages of, of their recovery, particularly early on. And this profession in Vermont is now recognized by the IC and RC, which is the National Certifying Board, which is amazing. We've, we at the Department of Health has, have been strengthening our commitment to recovery by dedicating a staff person, Kelly Morrill, right hey. here. She is our program manager for recovery services and is tasked with coordinating statewide recovery work. Uh, looking at systems improvements and providing tech technical assistance and training. And we're so lucky to have Kelly in this role. So Kelly, thank you so much. 
even though it gets a little confusing, Kelly and Kelly. Um, and Tim Ash talked about stigma, and I wanted to make a note that uh, the Department of Health right now is actually actively working on a very broad stigma campaign that will launch this fall that is really aimed at um, breaking down the stigma around substance misuse and addiction. Uh, and the, the campaign is really targeted to family members, friends, community members, um, people in helping professions who may work with people um, either uh, struggling with substance misuse or who are in recovery. We did a survey of over 300 people across Vermont to get their thoughts about how they felt about people with substance misuse disorder or um, people in recovery and really got a lot of rich information that really gave us um, a path as to where we need to go in order to start uh, messaging to break down the stigma. And so the, the, the campaign will be multimedia and it's going to really address addiction as a health issue and really talk about language that can help support people, particularly those supporting family members or friends um, in their path to recovery so that, um, that they can best guide their family members into the path that works for them. It will look at treatment and recovery options and what community members can do to support people with substance use disorder um, in the community. And our hope is that this messaging will drive more people to pursue recovery and to utilize the life-saving services that you all provide. And finally, another initiative of the health department that we'll actually be launching next month is a centralized call center that will be a single point of contact for Vermonters who are looking either for information about substance use disorder or looking to access treatment or recovery services, there will be one number that people can call through which they can be directly connected to treatment services. So rather than saying, oh now, okay, here are these five different places that you can try to call to get an appointment, this call center will be able to actually schedule people for an appointment with a treatment provider right then and there from that one phone call and will also be a clearinghouse for resources for family members who are looking for support for themselves as they try to support their loved one and also just providing information about substance use generally and will also of course have all of the resources around recovery services throughout Vermont so that people can be connected to the services that you all provide. We're really excited about this. Yeah. It's called Vermont Help Link, and we will be doing a media campaign as it's released so that people are aware of the, um, of the service. We're actually doing some test calls right now to make sure that it's, it's working well, and if anyone is interested in participating and doing some test calls, um, you can get in touch with us at the health department and we can uh, let you know how to do that because we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're doing it right. So there's so much to celebrate today, and again, I congratulate each and every one of you who has found your own path to recovery, and those of you who are here supporting the loved ones in your life and their recovery, and um, I hope you have a great day, and I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much, Peter and Peter, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, great. I uh, want to also give a shout out to Kelly and to Lori. Thank you for all you're doing and, and thank you for, for um, introducing us to, your next, to our next speakers. We want to start um, with an individual whose uh, mom, Brenda Bisbee, has been just a huge leader uh, in Vermont in education, in health issues, in the arts. I was delighted to see on the other generation that his daughter is now active in highlighting best practice uh, community organizations through Community Access TV. Uh, Allison's just amazing. And uh, Josh has done great things for my community uh, of Shelburne and is just sort of a terrific uh, guy about town and a real supporter of what needs to get done. 
So it's my honor to bring up to the stage Josh Simons. Josh, let's hear it. Come on. Uh, I have three to five minutes, and I've never gotten anything done in three to five minutes <laughs> in my life. Uh, the purpose of me being up here when uh, Kelly approached me uh, was to uh, be out about being in recovery and being a professional. I'm a lawyer in private practice, uh, and uh, I also uh, participate in uh, an organization called uh, the Vermont uh, Lawyers Assistance Program. Uh, and uh, lawyers, like a lot of professionals, uh, experience higher rates of uh, substance use disorder uh, and mental health problems uh, than uh, the general public. Uh, for example, uh, on uh, substance abuse disorder, lawyers are uh, almost uh, uh, four times uh, the, uh, popula the general population. Uh, it's a, at a 20% rate. So I give little talks in rooms full of lawyers, and I calculate how many people are in the room, and then I have them count off by five, and I make all the ones stand up. Because when you're in a room full of normies and they look at uh, every fifth person standing up, it begins to impress them. Um, there's another thing here, and I'm glad that stigma has come up, because uh, I, I heard uh, that uh, Burlington uh, is the second highest per capita concentration of lawyers uh, in the country besides uh, D.C., and we know that in D.C. you want to drain the swamp. Uh, I, I also know, as some of you may know, uh, that uh, Coventry is the site of the largest landfill uh, in the state. Uh, the thing that I didn't realize is that apparently Coventry got to choose first. Um, <laughs> That, that gives you a little thing about, you know, that, that jibe to lawyers. And lawyers being out um, and being in recovery is really a very challenging thing to do for those professionals. Uh, if they walk into a 12-step meeting, they may see somebody, especially if they're doing criminal defense work. Uh, they may just see people in the community. And there is that stigma still alive and well. And if it weren't for the work of this kind of thing and of Recovery Day and of all you people normalizing it and explaining that it is an illness um, and that it is a matter of public health, um, we'd still be in, 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 in serious trouble. Uh, so I have an, uh, 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 a message of gratitude to your profession um, and to, to your occupation in the recovery community in general, that we all boats rise with it. Um, and never forget that there are plenty, plenty of one percenters. I mean, I was in Boston and in recovery and in secret lawyer meetings at the top of skyscrapers with decision makers who controlled the fate of the city. And, uh, you know, they are in recovery too. This is something that uh, strikes across all fronts. Uh, one other thing I'll leave you with, I haven't even gotten the minute yet, but I'm, I'm on a roll here. Um, uh, this guy apparently uh, found, a, uh, uh, found a, uh, a lamp and rubbed it, and a genie came out and said, you have three, three wishes. And uh, he said, I wish for a, lawyer, a, a world without lawyers. And the genie, done. And then the genie said, no more wishes. And the guy said, I thought I had two more wishes. And the guy said, the genie said, sue me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. Thank, thank you so much, John. Great. Uh, our, our next uh, guest is uh, someone who, who really took matters into his own hands. Uh, Phil LaCroix uh, was an auto mechanic living in Underhill, Vermont, when, um, frankly, in his words, he just had enough. He had enough of losing uh, friends and community members uh, to addiction. 
So he went on a long journey that was documented in this documentary that you may have seen if you were here earlier, and he has an extraordinary uh, tale to tell. So Phil LaCroix, everybody. Phil, where are you? Come on up here, Phil. Good morning, everybody. So everybody else has been kind of winging this, but I need to write this down. <laughs> so as you heard, my name's Phil LaCroix. Uh, I'm a mechanic and an ultra marathon runner from Bolton. Uh, like many of you, I have lost many close family members and friends um, to addiction. After a string of losses in 2016 and 17, I felt compelled to do something about it. In September of 2017, I started the nonprofit Enough is Enough VT. The goal was to raise awareness about the need for sober housing by raising $50,000 for safe housing and treatment centers through, uh, by through running the long trail in 10 days. Yes, that means I ran 273 miles in a week and a half in one of those. And it also happened to be one of the hottest Augusts on record. And I, I can attest to that. Uh, I encountered many lows while I was running. And I was able to pull myself through using memories of those lost. And by calling my trail friend Premin for roughly half the miles. I was able to complete the trail while raising over $30,000 to date. All of the money that's been raised has been split between V4 and Vermont Recovery Network. One thing I took away from this journey was that while I was helping within the re recovery community, I myself was struggling with alcohol addiction. If, I don't know how many of you guys were here earlier, if you were able to see the documentary that was playing, at the very end, when I finished the trail, I finished the trail with a hard cider in my pack. I never really thought that I had a problem I'd get home from a hard day at work, have a few drinks every day. Then the weekend would come and I would drink even more. I'd justify drinking by using it as a reward for running. I'd run 20 miles in the morning on Saturday and go home and get drunk that night and then get up the next day and do it all over again. My wife asked me to try slowing down um, in December of 2018. I fought a tooth and nail but now I've been sober for 14 months with no <laughs> Life has a way of testing you, and that's another thing I learned on the trail. I was hurt at work shortly after I stopped drinking, about three weeks later to be exact. Since then, there's been a number of setbacks, a shoulder surgery in July of last year with another shoulder surgery coming in the next month or so. But I've been able to maintain staying sober this entire time. My most, <laughs> my most trying time was this past December, um, two days after my one year anniversary of sobriety, when my brother was found uh, after an overdose. He left a four-year-old daughter in a hole that will never be filled. So my goal for 2020 is to try and raise the final $20,000 of the $50,000 goal set at the beginning of Enough is Enough. That amount is roughly what it takes to get a sober house off the ground and up and running. Um, in order to do that, I hope to be running a 250-mile race at Infinitus this May for my brother Tom. I'm going to try and use this event to get the conversation back in the minds of our local community and leaders. But if, if you haven't already, please, you know, reach out to me. Um, keep looking for upcoming showings of the documentary. It's called No Easy Mile. Um, one cool thing that's happened in the last couple months is that Vermont PBS has contacted us. Um, and they've actually picked up No Easy Mile to show in the the summer season of Made Here. Uh, it's a grouping of documentaries and videos that are made by local filmmakers on local issues. 
Um, if, if anybody here has any questions, wants to talk to me in any way, or has any way of helping out, please reach out before you guys head home today. I'll be around, just like everybody else. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Phil. Really a, um, a role model for all of us. Thank you. Um, it's uh, my pleasure now to bring up to the podium um, our colleague from the Upper Valley, who will be giving out a very special award, uh, Sheila Young. Sheila, let's hear it for Sheila. Everybody. I'm Sheila Young, and I'm the executive director of the Upper Valley Turning Point in White River. Um, and uh, I'm touched by, thank you, uh, what I just heard, and just want to say I'm sorry for your loss, Phil. And uh, but when we all hooted and hollered for your 14 months, I think that's we're, we're celebrating recovery. We're celebrating life, and uh, and that's really what happens here. We celebrate life. Um, and uh, so I too had to write a couple things. Um, I want to thank everybody who's here, thank the state um, for supporting us, and uh, and I, as one of the twelve centers that exist in the state, you guys are my people, and uh, I had have had the opportunity to. Um, work with someone who uh, really um, had, had a vision for his center. And uh, I recently went to the, uh, or about a year ago, to the grand opening of the new Turning Point Center of Chittenden County. And that is a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And if you haven't visited, you probably ought to. They have space for, it's everything a center would want to be. There's space for art and for music and for meetings and for parents and for, and they do the, the emergency department. There's so much going on there and it is it's such a beautiful thing. Um, but what I know is, is that without the people who come to the building, it's just a building, just like our center. <coughs> And what I've witnessed, it's really been my honor to witness and be a part of, is um, the directors, well, this morning, I was sort of sitting on the edge, and Gary, who you already saw at the beginning, um, as he walked past me, he tapped me, and I felt a kindness. Um, I felt that, and, and that's what I'm here to celebrate. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to give Gary this award for his leadership and for the work that he's done in Chittenden County and for recovery for the state, for all the centers. I, and, and Gary has some, I just love him, and he has some beautiful qualities. And when I don't, I may not have ever said this to him, but when I'm not sure how to deal with something, I kind of sit and watch Gary, because <laughs> Gary knows what to do. I say, what would Gary do? Um, but so uh, I just want to honor Gary DeCarolis for his work at the, at the Chittenden County Turning Point. Thank you all. <clears throat> a few notes. <laughs> That's the wrong notes. Hi there, you. 
All right, let me see if I can get through this. Oof. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you all. So I've had the honor of being um, the executive director of the Turning Point Center of Chittenden County for the last seven years. It's been amazing. Um, you've uh, allowed me into your lives in all kinds of different ways. Um, and I feel very blessed by that. You may not know, but uh, my, uh, I'm a therapist by trade, although most of my career has been in human service administration. And um, so <clears throat> therapists tend to um, be sensitive to the little things in life, the little things in people's lives. I have to say, after <clears throat> seven years, I've never met a group of people who are more insightful more thoughtful, more deep than the people that I've met through my work in the recovery field. You're amazing. On top of that, I don't think I've ever met a group of people, and I love coming into work every day because of this, with such talents, the music, the arts, writing. Phenomenal people walk through our doors every single day. And um, half the time I'm serenaded by amazing guitar players and singers and poets, and it's just a phenomenal thing, and you get paid for it, too. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you all for that. Now, we've got a job to do, whether I'm the executive director or not. And I think Tim Ash talked a little bit about it. And you probably, everyone in this room and others that are around the state, have to take an extra measure of burden because we need to take ignorance and turn it into insight. We need to um, move people across the state to understand the illness that many people have to struggle with and see the beauty in every one of those people, including everyone in this room, and hundreds across the state. That's a challenge that we absolutely have to meet. We cannot walk away from that. And to me, it's a challenge that we can do. Um, Vermont, as you know, has been the first of many things in this world. Um, we have last night celebrated one of our senators who was able to win a primary and move on to the national stage and front runner status in the Democratic Party. We are changed people. We are destined for some reason or another to make a difference where other states and other communities cannot do that. And I know that we can have a state that understands what's going on rather than sits in ignorance and makes judgment. And so we're all tasked with that, in my mind, to do that. Now, so when I've approached my work, I always, for some reason, I think my father was, uh, gave me this little blessing, but he said, you know, whatever you do in life, if you want to be a janitor, be the best janitor in the world. If you want to be a carpenter, be the best carpenter in the world. Well, those weren't fields that I chose to take, but I approach my work and I talk to my other 11 colleagues around the state and all of you out there is that whatever we do, it should be world class. And when you do that, you can make amazing things happen. Now, are we always going to be able to achieve everything we want to achieve in life? Absolutely not. And we have to be good to ourselves when we don't achieve them, not beat ourselves over the head. Um, so there's a little quote that I think fits this situation. A guy named Les Brown said it that most people in organizations fail in life not because they aim too high and miss, but because they aim too low and hit. So aim high, go forth, and thank you. Thank you, Gary. A beautiful man. 
A, uh, I'd like to bring up to the stage now a, another beautiful human being uh, who will introduce a beautiful program, uh, Nancy Bassett. Nancy, where are you? Nancy Bassett, everybody. Come on, you can't hide from us. Hi, everyone. How are you this morning? Are you great? Great. Right. Right. Um, I am Nancy Bassett, and I'm a person in long-term recovery, which for me means I haven't picked up a drink or a drug for 20 years. <laughs> in my first years in recovery, coming back to St. Johnsbury, I got to know a great person named Bess O'Brien. And Bess O'Brien and Gary Miller, after a few years, started a wonderful program called Writers for Recovery. Yeah. And Bess and Gary are here today because they have some people to read for us. Yeah. They're gonna be great. Yeah. Hello everybody, how are you doing? Good morning. All right, I'm Beth, this is Gary, Writers for Recovery. Many of you out there I recognize who have been in our workshops over the last uh, five years. This year is our fifth year. Um, we're celebrating. We're going to do some fun things this year to celebrate. Absolutely, yeah. uh, dance parties, you know, non alcoholic yeah, raves, raves, everything. Raves, everything. everything. Um, a parade. We, yeah. We just want to tell you a few things that uh, we've done over the last year, and then we're going to bring up some people to read some pieces that they've written in some of our workshops. So, I'll start. Uh, last year, you may know, we, uh, Writers for Recover Recovery, collaborated with Vermont Public Radio to produce uh, six podcasts focused on people in recovery. Many of them were also reading some of their work from the workshops. Um, that was an extremely successful airing of those podcasts, and we were so thrilled because nearly 200,000 downloads across the country happened um, across the country. That's correct, yeah, <laughs> that was great. That was cool. Um, yeah, um, we also did workshops. We usually do 10-week workshops, and we did workshops in Barrie, Hardwick, Rutland, Middlebury, St. Johnsbury, um, correctional facilities in Rutland and Springfield. So we were all over the state, and this year we've just added um, another workshop leader, so we're going to be in even more places for the coming year. Um, you want to talk about the outside? Yeah, sure. Um, we had our first long-term workshop outside Vermont this year. Um, I went down, uh, I think, two years ago and trained eight people to be workshop leaders in the Adirondacks, and one of them started a Writers for Recovery group at Raybrook Federal Correctional Institute. So that was our first workshop outside of Vermont. We also collaborated this year with Scrag Mountain Music to do this awesome program with uh, seven or eight women from the Lund home. Um, and what it is is we, Gary and I came in and we worked with these women to create original lullabies for their unborn children or their babies who had just been born. And we wrote the lyrics with them, and then Scrag Mountain came in and put, put them to music. And so all of these women who are in recovery now have their own lullaby that they can sing to their children, which is just an amazing, wonderful thing. And um, Scrag Mountain did a concert where they uh, sang all of the lullabies, and now these women have their own special lullaby for their children. So that was really cool. Um, so I already mentioned that thing. 2020 is our um, fifth year, so we want to make it a little bit awesome. And as Beth said, we, we have a lot of events that are, that are still in the planning stages. Um, we're going to continue to do great workshops. We're going to do a special edition of our annual anthology, the book we publish, Greatest Hits and New Stuff. So if you haven't gotten one, stay tuned for this year. It's going to be really great. And for any of you out there who want to bring Writers for Recovery to your recovery center, please go to our website, call us, email us. 
Um, we love coming and working with you. And, you know, I, I, I'm doing my second year of uh, Writers for Recovery workshops at Lund. So it doesn't have to be at a recovery center. We've done workshops in libraries and schools and social service agencies. We also do trainings. So please think of us. We, we love you guys and um, gals, and we want to work with you. And I shouldn't really say it out loud, but Writers for Recovery Ireland may be happening very soon. Uh, someone reached out to us from the west coast of Ireland, a woman who attended our workshop in Middlebury, and we're trying to make that happen. So we may be uh, international. Um, yeah, and finally we want to just thank our major sponsors, the Vermont Department of Corrections, the Rona Jaffe Foundation, a number of individual donors, in including Nat Winthrop. So thank them all. And now we're going to get to the really important um, part of our presentation. Our first reader is Jacqueline Joy. I'm nervous. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Joy, and I'm someone who's in long-term recovery. <clears throat> and the Writers for Recovery group has been uh, transformative this last year. I wrote this in our last session. It's for my father. If I had a chance, I would stop time and go back to May 1, 1961, 2.59 AM. I would pull out all the favors I stored up and beg my guardian angels to sit on the car horn and blare Frank's sleeping body awake. I'd stop the car from slamming into the Grand Oak Tree on Route 940, and I'd save the life of my father, John Norman Shevlin. 26 was an awfully early age to leave this world, and I guess you did everything on planet Earth you were meant to do. But I dream of a world where I had a loving father to teach me about men, music, and God. I dream of a world where abuse was a story I heard about as an adult rather than lived with every day. If I had a chance, I would stop time and make you mine, here in the flesh rather than there in spirit. I know I can talk to you, and I can even hear you. But damn, if I could have stopped time, I would have been able to see you and lead into you and feel your heartbeat. And reading next is Nathan Merrill. Hi, <coughs> I am Nate Merrill. Um, this is titled, I Haven't Been Down This Road Before. <clears throat> and I just want to give a quick word about writers. Um, I, one of my writings was, I think the prompt was something to do with, I can't remember, but one of my lines was, it's okay to be in a writing class and hate writing. <laughs> um, and uh, I stand by that sentiment. <laughs> um, I've had periods in life where, um, Words were hard to come by uh, because they felt dangerous, um, because the truth of experience felt unbearable. Um, and Writers for Recovery has helped me um, feel, regain a sense of safety um, to express what's there. So I'm really grateful to, for, uh, to them. I haven't been down this road before is a sentiment I would often refract in some way at the relative peak of some chemically induced trip, a drunkenness, a highness. I didn't used to be like this, I once told a lover, with no memory of having done so, as I slipped into unconsciousness. I hadn't been down this road before, I'd say, excitedly sometimes, wistfully sometimes, but always with a sense of long overdue entitlement, like I'd been robbed by whom I couldn't say, 
of a cultural right of youthful passage to freedom from the inhibitions and fears of a muted self from isolation. Where to now? Thanks. Our next reader is Bess O'Brien, and she is reading for Cassandra Johnson. All right, one thing uh, Gary and I didn't say is that um, when we do these workshops, we give people prompts, and they have seven minutes to write. That's it. So everything you're hearing today was written in seven minutes, which is pretty miraculous. How to Write for Recovery by Cassandra Johnson. I could start by sharing my experience, strength, and hope. But I'm sure that's not what you want to hear. Hearing this at many meetings before, there is so much more, the blood, sweat, and tears, the reality of addiction, the shakes and bone aches and restless legs, the real life shit one endures. Not so, fu so fun sounding, huh? The not being able to find a job, the not seeing your kids shit because you burnt all your bridges but didn't give up to lose hope shit. Shit, shit, the never giving up shit. The anger inside, but smiles on at the outside. Let it be known that recovery isn't easy. How to write about recovery? There is no such rule. It's how you want it to be. This is your program, recovery is possible, and this is your time. Reading next is Gary Miller. I'm going to read um, for a guy named Oscar Delgado Jr., and he is in from the Turning Point of Chittenden County uh, Writers Recovery Group. Piece called Nobody Really Knows. Nobody really knows how it happened. The friend, the lover, the fighter for your rights. Nobody really knows how he fell, where he went to. He would just disappear. Nobody really knows how it happened that someone so supportive, strong, kind, and gentle could be lost for 20 years. He came back once, twice, three times, many really, but always disappeared. Nobody really knows how it happened. He was so broken, but thought he was fine. Nobody really knows how it happened. Now they see him, he smiles. Is it real this time? Nobody really knows the pain it caused, the lessons he's still learning, the tears he cries to God, if only, never comes out. It's gratitude now. Nobody really knows how it happened, how he woke from the nightmare. All they had to do was ask. God did. God knows. And there's a secret to his new self. Our next reader. Our next reader is my buddy, Jeff Morse. I'm having an in-the-body experience. <laughs> anyway, don't forget to. Thankful comes to mind, followed by grateful, just full. The realizing of the fact that you must stay focused, aware, cognizant at least, went out and about. But it is good to not let it slide. Keep an eye on what is important, and above all, don't forget to write, draw, care, walk, contribute, pray. The breathing is key, the just being is the thing. Aware, empathy, staccato, imbued, rhythm of rainbow, mining dawn, something like that. But I reckon what it all boils down to is this. Don't forget that you are loved, and in turn, love. Today's final reader taking it home is the indomitable Ashley Hickey. I'm Ash. Um, so if I had a chance, if I had a chance, 
I would take it and go. And it starts with cutting the base, but not every base. Then new limbs will grow and bear fruit. But some stems must go and some trimmed. If I had a chance, I would just take it and go. Deeper, dig deeper, cut it and stack it, enjoy. Use the fire, watch that fire. Let the warmth engulf you. Stack runs low, sharpen the blade, fill the oil and gas and go. If I had a chance, I would take it and go. Straight to the pond and soak. Swim to that rock, get on top. Feel the sun, cause I'm the best. And run, jump, and swim faster than the leeches. Get out and take the chance. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you to all our writers. <laughs> now we have um, a, an annual award that has a uh, really a great deal of meaning for the recovery community. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the giants in recovery uh, whose shoulders we are standing on. And one of those giants was Jack Berry. Jack was a prominent, prominent figure in Vermont's media community, on the radio, on TV. He was a fierce advocate for public media. And he was also one of the first prominent Vermonters to be very open and proud of his recovery and of the recovery of his loved ones. So every year we give the Jack Berry Award in honor of an individual or an organization who has done exceptional things in communicating the power of recovery. And this year, we are delighted and moved and just overwhelmed with how powerful uh, this series has been. And this year's award is going to the writer Kate O'Neill and to Seven Days for their series, Hooked, Stories and Solutions from Vermont's Opioid Crisis. If you have read any of this journalism, you know how powerful it is, how powerful it speaks to our condition here in Vermont, and how uh, it's been picked up nationwide as an important testament to this healthcare crisis. So uh, here to accept the award um, on behalf of Kate and uh, Seven Days, is Kate's sister, Maura O'Neill, and uh, Kathy Resmer from Seven Days. We'd like them both to please come up and get their awards. And then I believe Maura will speak first and then Kathy. So <coughs> Seven Days and Kate O'Neill. I'm Maura O'Neill, Kate's sister. She's so sorry she couldn't be here today and asked that I accept this award on her behalf. She did send some remarks, so I'll read those now. Thank you so much to Recovery Vermont for this award. In the course of the reporting I did last year, I spoke to many Vermonters who benefited from the work of this organization. People who received support from recovery coaches or regularly visited recovery centers. These services are crucial, not just to people, not just to helping people achieve and maintain recovery by normalizing and supporting remission from substance use disorder. Recovery Vermont helps reduce the stigma and shame associated with this disease. So it's a special honor to be recognized by an organization that is having such a positive impact on people and in communities across the state. In recognizing the series I wrote last year, Recovery Vermont is recognizing the Vermonters who so generously shared their stories with me for that series and the story of my sister Maddie, 
who died 16 months ago after struggling with substance use disorder for more than a decade. Seven Days invited me to write the series that is being recognized today after the obituary I wrote for my sister went viral. So in a way, I'm being given this award as a result of my sister's death. On Recovery Day, we celebrate not just people who have achieved recovery, but the very possibility of recovery itself. Flyers advertising this event end with the sentence, recovery is possible, written in capital letters with two exclamation points at the end. This is something I believed fervently for the 12 years my sister struggled with substance use disorder. Until she took her last breath, I believed that recovery was indeed possible for Maddie. But last year, as I reported the series that is being recognized today, I learned another saying, one I hadn't known when she was alive. You can't recover if you're dead. Addiction, okay, I'm a crier, so get ready. <laughs> I know this award isn't for me, but I'll still cry while accepting it. <laughs> Addiction is a dangerous, often deadly disease. And my sister Maddie is one of hundreds, if not thousands, of Vermonters with substance use disorder who die each year before they can recover. They die of overdose, they die in accidents, they die of in infections, they die of despair. So though we have gathered today to celebrate recovery and support those who have achieved it, I ask on behalf of my sister and the many Vermonters who have died before they could recover, that we support, celebrate, and love both people who are in recovery and those who are not. I'm asking that we offer not just the tools to achieve recovery and support when people get there. I'm also asking that we offer the tools and support people need to stay safe when they are actively using drugs and alcohol, when recovery feels impossible, like a faraway dream. I'm asking that we not just support recovery centers, but harm reduction services too. I'm asking that we advocate for housing and health care for people who are in recovery and those who are in the throes of their addiction. I'm asking that we love and support people who are actively struggling with their disease just as much as we love and support those who are in remission from it. Sixteen months after my sister died, I still believe that recovery is possible. The stories people have shared with me since her death and the many faces here today are proof. Recovery is possible, but not if you're dead. The award I'm receiving today is named for a beloved Vermonter and advocate for people with addiction. According to the award description, Jack Berry was a man who, quote, reminded us all that individuals can and should speak out publicly on behalf of all Vermonters. This is what I'm asking of you today, that you speak out publicly on behalf of all Vermonters those with substance use disorder who are in remission from their disease, and those who are not. Thank you. Like Maura, I'm a crier too, and um, it's, uh, it's, this is so powerful um, and inspiring what you're all doing here. And it's such an honor um, for seven days to be in this space with you today that you invited us here. Um, I want to, before I have some remarks too, but before I launch into them, I just want to recognize Paula Routley, who's our seven days publisher and um, co-editor. She wishes she could be here. She was not able to join us this morning. Um, but it was, it, Paula actually um, conceived this series and fought for it and convinced everybody on our seven days leadership team that it was not only a good thing to do, it was a necessary thing to do. Um, and it, it's the, the biggest project we've ever undertaken. <clears throat> and it, it required um, more resources than anything we've ever done. Um, so it was, it, was, it was quite an effort. Um, and I just, I wanna also recognize our, our underwriters for the series. So in addition, we, we've never actually gotten underwriters for an editorial project before, but when we, um, conceived of this idea and um, Kate agreed, we realized that we um, could use some support to, to do this for the year. And we were so fortunate 
um, in December before Kate even showed up on the job um, that uh, the UVM Health Network and the Vermont Community Foundation and Pomerleau Real Estate and Ernie Pomerleau supported this series, just the, the idea of it, they supported it and financially. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without that help to defray the costs. So I want to recognize them. If, and if you, um, if you know them, thank them, because this wouldn't, I'm not sure this could have happened without them. Um, so, oh, and I also want to mention that it, it's an honor for us to um, receive this award named for the legendary Vermont broadcaster, um, Jack Barry. Uh, from what I gather, he understood the responsibility that we in the media have to be prepared and to do our homework and to get it right. Um, to put, and he also understood the power that we in the media can have to shape stories and to put things into context. And we take all of that very seriously at Seven Days. Um, so as I said, this, this series was different from anything we've done before. Usually journalists avoid writing about subjects they're close to. Um, in this case, um, we just follow, you know, thought this would be a good fit because, because Kate was close to it. Um, and just so you know, just some, um, more I mentioned the, um, the obituary that, how, that, that um, brought this about. I just wanted to share a little background of what that was like um, at seven days when this was happening. Um, when we initially published that obituary, it was immediately apparent to us what a powerful piece of writing it was. Um, we knew Kate, but we hadn't known Maddie, and Kate made us feel her loss. Um, other people obviously felt the same way, and they were sharing it on social media. We could see that. You probably know this, but four million people eventually read that obituary over the course of just a few days. Um, now, if you're in New York City, four million people, oh yeah, that's no big deal. Vermont. Uh, that's like a big deal, <laughs> four million people. Um, and it was being shared all over um, the country. And um, you know, when something goes viral online, which I'm sure all of you have the experience of reading comments online, um, and when something goes viral, people say <coughs> terrible things um, online that they would never say to someone's face. Uh, and you know, we allow negative comments on stories that we publish, but we have a different standard when it comes to paid obituaries. And we, you know, I was, I'm on the digital team and I was, as we were started to see all this traffic, um, I, you know, I, I stayed up all night just thinking like, I gotta, if there's a comment that comes in that's bad, we've gotta, we've gotta get rid of that. I do not want anyone seeing that. Um, and uh, I, was, I was bracing for the, the, um, the response that I, that I knew, everything that I, in my experience has told me was coming. Um, but, uh, of the more than 1,000 comments we received, we had to delete only seven of them. So that response was completely different from anything that you would have been led to expect. Um, and what was even more remarkable was that the comments came, not only that they came from all over, um, what was really remarkable to me was that they were all so personal and specific. And they all, mo many of them, were very similar in that they described someone who had lost a loved one, someone who was still struggling, um, someone who, we had people say, I just lost my daughter yesterday. Um, and to be on the receiving end of that and watching this come in, you know, I know, <laughs> I know about the opioid crisis. You know, we've been writing about it at seven days for for years, I've written, you know, I, I myself have written about Turning Point um, and, and Gary and the work that um, you all do. And we wrote about that program that um, Bess and um, Gary just talked about, the, uh, the Scrag Mountain Music Lullaby Program. We wrote about that in Kids Vermont. We were writing all kinds of stories and winning journalism awards and um, even sparking legislative change. Um, but none of that um, had got the response that this got, um, that this, the, these stories got, and when I was reading these these comments, I was just I, I was struck. I was like, this this is something I haven't seen before. Um, all of these people speaking out in this way, um, in this space, and it was really incredible. Um, so, you know, we thought two things. It was clear to us that there are more stories to tell, and that because of this tragedy, Kate might be able to tell them in a way that people could hear. Um, I think Gary talked about. Um, he talked about uh, moving people to understand and, and seeing the beauty in people. Um, 
you know, you can intellectually understand all this stuff, but you, when you read someone's personal story and you can empathize, you, you understand it in your heart, you understand it in a different way. And that's what these stories um, and these personal stories are, 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 are doing. Um, amazingly, when we approached Kate about this, she was willing to take this journey with us and to combine her personal story with additional reporting about the history and causes of the epidemic, of all the, the, the systems that her sister had been through. Um, and this journey was not easy. Uh, in addition to getting up to speed on this beat and reporting and writing these very complicated stories, Kate was grieving her sister. Um, I can't imagine what that was like for her. Um, but she is just so amazing. You know, she faced that with this unflinching honesty and courage um, and wrote about what she learned and reconsidered in the stories, her own actions um, for, from the past. And you know, her courage and, and willingness to do that encouraged all of us, her readers, and even us at Seven Days, her editors, to examine our own actions. Um, and I'll tell you, this series didn't just change the way that, um, that, that our readers were, were seeing these stories. It was also, they were also changing the way that we, as the media, as people who didn't have necessarily a personal connection to this. It really changed the way that we saw these stories that we were writing. Um, you know, so one of the things that came out of this whole experience is that the series is over, um, but we did start the All Our Hearts project. Um, there's a table out in the hall. We thought that if one story could do this, one person's story could do this, think of what other stories could do, more stories, um, and remembering those who we've lost. Um, and all the people who aren't able to be with us here today. Uh, those stories have power, and we invite you to share them with us. Um, we're, we're giving away at the table these, uh, some handmade hearts. We asked participants who shared stories about their loved ones through the All Our Hearts Project. We invited them to a, um, a workshop where they made clay hearts um, for their loved ones that they'd lost, imprinted with the website address, allourhearts.com. This is one of them I carry with me. Um, about Angela um, Bowser Camaletti. Angela, remember her, says in the back. Um, and we passed out um, a couple hundred of these stones at a reception in Burlington in December, and we're going to continue doing this and handing these out. It's one way to um, keep these going. And I, the name All Our Hearts came from a line in Kate's obituary for Maddie, which I'm going to leave you with. Um, these beautiful words. Kate wrote, if you yourself are struggling from addiction, know that every breath is a fresh start. Know that hundreds of thousands of families who have lost someone to this disease are praying and rooting for you. Know that we believe with all our hearts that you can and will make it. It is never too late. We believe that too, and thank you for the work that you're doing here at Recovery in Vermont, and please keep sharing your stories. Oh, it's not for me. <laughs> uh, one second, folks. Uh, I'm Peter Mallory. I'm a person in long-term recovery and honored to be here today with all of you who make this green for me all the time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also... I'm going to be joined by Daniel Franklin, who's the director of the North Central Recovery Center. Did I get that right? North Central Vermont, yes. North Central Vermont Recovery Center in Morrisville. Love um, you, I usually get the chance to do the Legislative Champion Award, and I get that chance again today with Daniel's help. And our champion today is, and I'll let the cat out of the bag since he already knows, is David Iacovoni, representative from which town, David? Morrisville. Morrisville. <laughs> uh, 
I wanted to say a few general words. David and I served in the legislature together along with Jack Barry. Do you remember? Or was he gone by the time you got there? Yeah, I thought he was. That's how old we are. Um, and uh, Dave um, has done so many different things. I was going to try to read some of them to you. He graduated from Johnson State, spent his 40-year career in Vermont working in health and human services at the local and state level. Professional career included working as a licensed nursing home administrator for 16 years and in various roles in Vermont state government, including commissioner of aging and disabilities in the Dean administration and as commissioner for children and families in the Shumlin administration. He's been active in community affairs for many years, including a combined 30 years of civic experience as a town moderator. I didn't know you did that. I do that. <laughs> uh, select board member, school board member, justice of the peace, planning commissioner. Um, his past community service work includes serving as trustee for community health services of Lamoille Valley, Lamoille Home Health, Lamoille Mental Health and Copley Hospital. He currently serves as a trustee for the Manor Nursing Home. Dave served in the Vermont General Assembly representing Hyde Park and Wilkett from 1993 to 96. And that's when we were there together. And then after doing all of those amazing things, he had the audacity to return to the legislature. <laughs> and he now serves on the Appropriations Committee in the House. And he is a very dear friend to what we do and the issues that we work on. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that we had a chance to honor him. Um, I think of him as a dear friend as well. And Daniel works with him now. Uh, and uh, I thought it would be nice if Daniel would say a few words before we turn it over to Dave. As you can tell from what Peter said, uh, Dave Iacovini has accomplished a lot in his life and helped a lot of people. His impact continues to reverberate in communities throughout Vermont. As his wife Debbie wrote to me, uh, Dave's whole career has been about serving others uh, and helping people in need to fight poverty, illness, and addiction. In 2002, he helped to secure funding to establish the two, first two recovery centers in Vermont. But Debbie added, what defines Dave is not so much what we know he does for others, but the things he does for others that we do not know about. On the one hand, this is totally fitting, considering Dave's remarkable humility and kindness, um, which go along with his generosity and his patience. I have no doubt that it's true that there's a lot that Dave does that we don't see. On the other hand, it makes me wonder how he finds the time, because there's a lot we do see. Dave seems to be everywhere. Somehow, whether it's a holiday party or an open house at the recovery center or a local nonprofit's annual meeting or one of his rock star son Seth's gigs or at trivia night with his team, which I think is called the Brainiacs, or at a public forum, Dave is a cherished and omnipresent fo uh, force for good in our region. When we were working with V4 to open a women's recovery residence, not only did Dave show up at the Development Review Board to support us when other neighbors showed up to keep us out, but he said to me, when everyone's settled in, let me know and I'll bring over a pie or a lasagna. <laughs> um, personally, I want to thank you for your support for me and, and our recovery center from day one, Dave, and, uh, which says nothing about me and everything about you and your generous spirit. I want to thank you on behalf of our community, and it's honor, our honor to thank you for your support for the recovery centers and the people they serve, and for your care for the most vulnerable people in our state throughout your distinguished career by recognizing you as the 2020 legislative champion.
Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I told Peter that that sounded like my obituary. I don't have to write it now. <laughs> but I would mention my family, too. Uh, I, I will be brief. Um, it's been said before, but I think uh, bears repeating. Better the occasional faults of a government that lives in the spirit of charity than the consistent omissions of a government frozen in the ice of its own indifference. The Constitution does not compel us to house the homeless, to feed the hungry, or help the hopeless. We do these things because our moral compass points in the direction of kindness. Each of us, each of us probably has our, our own idea of what government should or should not be. Mine is not that complicated. Simply believe whenever we can to pay it forward. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you. Um, I know that um, we have Commissioner Levine scheduled, but I'm sure he's on his way here. So we will um, go next to our first group of speakers talking about our theme this year. Our theme is Vermont Recovers Together. It recovers in families, it recovers among friends, it recovers in our recovery centers. And it also recovers in the many partnerships and supports uh, that we have throughout the community. One of the best practices and most hopeful practices that we've been hearing about in our shop over the past couple of years has been the tremendous work that uh, Tracy and her colleagues in Rutland have been doing with their local um, uh, correctional facility and with the leaders there. Really developing uh, recovery supports in the facility itself and then in seeing that handoff as individuals re-enter their communities. It's kind of a special program. So uh, before we hear from Dr. Levine, we'd love to hear about this great work being done in Rutland. So, Tracy and your team, if you can come up here. Where is Tracy? There she is. Come on, everybody. Thank you. Tracy, you are so wonderful. Well, thank you. Did you so much hard work. So are you. Thank Lucky you. to have you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, it's an honor to be here. It is, I'm so grateful to see everybody here. And I get to talk about a program that we do at our center that I'm extremely proud of and that I have a great passion for. Um, in June of 2016, we started, I think it was part of a grant that we had with West, Westridge where the Pathways guys were working 10 hours with the hubs to provide, it was like an MAT integration grant. And our Pathways Guide had the ability to start expanding groups and she started doing them in the correctional facility, in Marble Valley Correctional Facility. Unfortunately, that kind of fell away, but our, I was doing some of the groups with her myself um, and I realized that we needed to continue those groups. Um, we were doing Making Recovery Easier and Smart Recovery in the jail twice a week and our hope was to provide connection for people that you know were housed in the facility and, and to let them know that we were there for them when they got out and that we wanted to support them. And um, we continued doing the group. We had no funding for the program, we just kept doing it. And we started doing some coaching and then in 2018 we ended up getting the Bowes Health Trust grant in our community for three years which helped us expand that program. 
So now we have groups at the jail. We have recovery coaching that goes on three days a week in the jail. We also work with probation and parole. We provide groups and coaching to people in DOC transitional housing, like in Mandela and Sanctuary House. Homeless Prevention Center, they have DOC apartments, so we provide support for those individuals. We're part of adult treatment court. Um, we also do lots of groups for Serenity House. Um, we're hoping to get involved with federal drug court. And I mean, we're just like, just like shit, we're everywhere. We're in their faces, <laughs> you know? And, and it, that repeated contact builds trust. And you know, Tanya, my right-hand woman at the center, she was the one who was doing the groups with me for a while at the jail. It was her and I, and we're in a men's facility. But the respect that we got was amazing. And there was no crossing boundaries. Not to say some didn't try, but you know, didn't happen. So um, some statistics from our program. Recovery coaching, we've provided to 115 unique individuals within the correctional facility itself. <laughs> And there's 16 unique individuals who continue to be engaged since they were released. That's amazing. We've served through our smart recovery meetings in and outside of the facility. We've served 365 unique individuals, making recovery easier in and out of the facility, 342 unique individuals. And I think one of the biggest things, we kind of follow people with our grant funding we have them do surveys, assessments of recovery capital, and we track them. We try to get those monthly. As you can realize, it's kind of hard sometimes when somebody gets released, they don't have phones, they don't have, it's, it's hard to find them to do this. But of the 100, 67 of them have not been convicted of new charges. And based on that, the average cost of incarceration is $67,000 a year. So this is a cost savings and a reduce, reduction in recidivism of $4,489,000. And the need is there. I mean, individuals in corrections, you know, I mean, what I came to realize, I've never been incarcerated myself. Um, but I know that there's, you know, the stigma. If you're an addict, if you're a felon, nobody expects anything more of you. They need to be seen as human people and to see their, their potential and to see people that, that have people in their lives that just look at them as people. We all struggle, you know? We all struggle every day and it's, it's just amazing. And I have to say one of our goals was to, some of these people we served while they're incarcerated was to eventually have them become recovery coaches when they get out. And I've had my first one. And he's sitting over there and is Andrew Pelletier. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's just such a wonderful thing when you see people grow and change and, and start to believe in themselves and have faith in them. Um, it's, we need to be there. We need to be in corrections. We need to be everywhere where people are that are struggling. And, and you know, the judgment has got to be gone. Stigma's got to be gone. Um, these are people's brothers, fathers, you know. Um, and they can do it, and, and their stories of what they've been through are what's gonna give the hope to the next person that's struggling. So we need to really work hard to, to help these people transition when they get out of jail. You can't just give somebody a business card and say, go down to Turning Point Center. Because if they don't know the people there, they're not gonna trust them, and they're not gonna go. So build that trust so they feel safe when they come in. I also want to have Robert Blaze, who actually engaged with our program while he was incarcerated. He's been in adult treatment court. He's getting ready to graduate soon. And he continues. And he's continued with recovery coaching since he's been out. So I'm gonna have him share some of his experience. All right, thank you. Well, this is nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest crowd I've spoken in front of. Um, yeah, like Tracy said, you know, been in and out of jail pretty much my whole adult life. Um, 
the last time I was in there, <laughs> getting emotional. Um, last time I was in there, you know, I asked myself what I was doing wrong. And um, I had to, you know, finally come to terms that I was an, an addict. And every time I've ever been in trouble and gone to jail was because of addiction or alcohol. And uh, I would walk by Tanya and Tracy's meetings and while I was in jail as I'd go to the rec room. One day I decided to go in and um, that turned my life around for the good. It was ever since then that I knew I had to do something about this problem. So as I'm not knowing what's going on with my fate in, you know, in jail and stuff, I asked around and I heard about the Rutland County uh, Treatment Court. And I asked my lawyer to please sign me up for it. This is what I needed in my life. And as I'm in it, like Tracy said, I'm going to be graduating in six days. And <laughs> but it's been one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in life. Um, you know, as much as hell as I've been through, I've I got a lot of I've been very successful. I'm a lead foreman for a construction company. I would I drive a brand new company truck. I have two brand new vehicles. <laughs> So it's very, anything, you put your mind to anything, you can do it. And, um, you know, I, I thank Tanya and Tracy so much because they've been so, so much part of my life and the Rutland Treatment Corps as well. I was supposed to graduate back in July. Somebody touched on this earlier. And I thought I was ready, um, but alcohol came into my life. And I thought I had it, oh, it's just drinking, you know, no big deal. And uh, as I celebrate 27 months and three days from heroin, I also celebrated four months from drinking yesterday. And um, this is, you know, I love coming up here. This makes my third year in a row, the first time I get to speak in front of people. And today just happens to be my 40th birthday as well. <laughs> It's very, very humbling, very gratifying, and just as I look around the room and I see all the support that us addicts really have, and, you know, have out there that we didn't realize we had before, and um, you know, to to the addicts, to the parents, to the grandparents, to daughter, the daughters, the sons, the brothers, the sisters, one of the important things that you sh should always mention to your loved ones: make sure you tell them you're proud of them. I was 38 years old before my father ever told me that. And it stuck with me ever since. And uh, it was a big turn point in my recovery. It took recovery to hear my father tell me he was proud of me. Um, just keep that in mind. Because, you know, as addicts, sometimes we don't think people care. And that's one of the biggest fights we have. So um, I just want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank the Rutland Turning Point um, and Clay Gilbert, part of the treatment court team. He's been a big help, too. Um, it was a, it was an honor. Have a good day.